Welcome to Out of the Question, a podcast that looks behind some common questions and uncovers the question behind the question while providing real solutions for biblical world and life view. Your host is Andrea Schwartz, a teacher and mentor and founder of the Chalcedon Teacher Training Institute. Thanks for joining me again for this episode of the Out of the Question podcast. A number of years ago, when I was basically hosting another podcast, um, I heard the good news that one of the listeners of that podcast had connected with my guest. And as it turned out, that turned into the documentary Indoctrination, brought to you by Colin Gunn and Joaquin Fernandez. Joaquin's company, Great Commission Films, has made a number of other documentaries and has been working alongside Cal Seton for one that is soon to be released on the opioid crisis. But recently, as I was browsing through social media, I saw an ad for another one of his projects and then immediately looked at the trailer and purchased the online rental and watched the film Truth and Lies in American Education. And so I emailed him and said, Joaquin, who should I interview about this film? And big letters within a minute, Sherry Few. So that's who I have with me today. Sherry is the founder and president of United States Parents Involved in Education, U.S. PI, easy to remember, whose mission is to end the U.S. Department of Education and all federal education mandates. Now, that may seem like a tall order, but for a lot of us, you can get a really big amen to getting the federal government out of education. So, Sherry, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today on this podcast. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me, Andrea. I look forward to discussing education policy and and what I think is a crisis in our government schools today. Okay, so... I have this theory that uh, when the scripture says you don't want to get between a mama bear and her babies, that uh, a lot of people became active in this anti-federal government educational um, tyranny because women, mothers, saw what was happening to their children. So how did you get involved in this effort? Well, for me, it started 20 years ago, believe it or not, when my children were in middle school and there was uh, problems in the curriculum. I saw some really problematic issues in their geography lessons, which was touting China as this premier form of government and and sort of negative toward the United States and their descriptions and, and was even untruthful about how they describe China's form of government. And then beyond that, there were some real insidious sex education standards being proposed for our state. And again, that was 20 years ago. Believe it or not, even then, um, there was really some bad stuff. It's gotten far worse now, of course. But my par- uh, myself and other parents around the state where I live in South Carolina, we uh, joined forces and we um took basically a grassroots army of parents to the State Board of Education, and we were effective in improving those standards by pointing them more toward an abstinence until marriage approach. So that is what led to the formation of South Carolina Parents Involved in Education. So we worked on many issues uh, over those next 10 years or so, and one of the largest issues for us is we led the fight against the Common Core Standards uh, back in 2012, 2013. So that was a two-year battle, um, you know, convincing the legislature that the standards were um, wholly inappropriate for children. And it ended with our repeal bill being amended down to a simple rewrite of the standards. So the rewrite was going to be done by the next state superintendent of education, Uh, people recruited me to run for that position. I did run, and unfortunately, I narrowly missed the runoff and and was not elected. So it ended up in the hands of what what I like to call a rhino, um, a lady who was really a Democrat but ran as a Republican because she knew she had to to win in this state. And she gave us Common Core rebranded, and that happened all over the country. There's not a single state 
uh, outside of Florida have you, and that's only recent, that uh, does not have Common Core standards. So there were laborers across the country like myself who had led the fight against Common Core in their state, uh, two-year battle only to have Common Core rebranded. So I connected with some of those uh, folks because, you know, we were all very discouraged and thinking, well, what next? And that's when we expanded into a national organization and became United States parents involved in education. And I collaborated with these leaders, again, who had led the fight against Common Core in their state. And we adopted the mission to close the Federal Department of Education and all federal education mandates. And why that was important to us as a new mission was we understood that Common Core was just the latest iteration of um, outcome-based education that had been pushed down by the federal government uh, for many years. And so we knew that that's where most of the nefarious pedagogies come from, you know, with, and it's incentivized with federal dollars. So with Common Core, it was the race to the top grants. And now with critical race theory, it's being financially incentivized by the federal government through COVID relief funds. So that's why that is our mission, and it is a tall mission, as you suggested. Uh, but the good news is we, we don't just talk about it. You know, there's a lot of politicians that anywhere from school board to, to the president of the United States, when they're running for office, claim they're going to close the Department of Education. It's a, it's a great applause line. But what do they ever do? Even Ronald Reagan said he was going to close the Department of Ed. So we have developed a blueprint that breaks it down into five easy steps. Tell me what the Department of Education is all about. There might be some people listening and saying, well, we got a lot of departments we don't like in the federal government, the Internal Revenue Service, um, all sort, the Food and Drug Administration. What does the Department of Education have as its mission and why are you so opposed to that mission? What, what's at the root of it? Well, you know, I, I don't know for sure what their exact mission is, if they have a mission statement. But the Department of Education was formed to try to control education and, you know, turn it into a one size fits all uh, for for every student in the country. And, you know, of course, the um, Constitution does not uh, delegate those responsibilities, the education responsibilities to the federal government and anything that isn't. delegated to the federal government in the U.S. Constitution is left to states. So it is unconstitutional to have a federal department of education. They spend billions of dollars annually. And, and, and probably the original goal, Andrea, was, was to try to improve academic achievement. I mean, isn't that the goal usually with most education uh, bureaucracies? So while they've been around since the 60s, We have seen nothing but a decline in academic achievement. So if that was their goal, they have failed miserably. And yet we're spending billions upon billions of dollars every year funding their schemes. And that's exactly what it's become. They have a scheme to uh, control the American economy and they've turned education into workforce development. Um, And some of this is what we discuss in our new documentary. So it's not only the documentary that that we're going to talk about. um, It not only covers things like the sexualization of children and critical race theory, which are really hot buzzwords uh, in the culture today. But we also talk about this workforce development model of education, which was an intentional agenda that came from Mark Tucker through the Clintons. And even with the Bushes. So it's not just a Republican Democrat thing. It is, you know, the Republicans have been very, very wrong on education policy in addition to the Democrats. So America was founded by some pretty smart people who knew how to read, knew how to write, knew how to think, were informed not only by the Bible, but by Western civilization and the history of it. So how did American education get to the point that it needed fixing? After all, it was doing okay, and then there was a point at which it stopped doing okay. Well, I think that's when the Marxists infiltrated our country. 
uh, and particularly education in our country. So, you know, there was a, a school in Germany that's called the Frankfurt School, where the Marxists were creating critical theory, believe it or not. This was um, back during World War II. And when, when the war started, the Nazis ran them out of Germany and they went to New York, uh, to Columbia University. And so the Marxists infiltrated the schools there and then from there across the country. So, you know, our um, Ivy League schools, our colleges and universities, I'm sure you know, were first started uh, to, they were Christian institutions and they were started to help people know how to read their Bible because after the invention of the printing press, uh, people had their own copies of the scriptures and they wanted people to be able to read their scriptures and and they were training pastors in these Ivy League colleges. And all of that changed when the Marxists infiltrated our colleges and universities. And most people understand that the colleges and universities in our country are extremely liberal. Uh, it's it's just gotten so, so bad. And now um, it's trickled down into K-12. And it, again, it's been an intentional agenda and it's been uh, a slow creep. But now it is blatantly in your face, liberal indoctrination. And I believe, and I'm sure you would agree, it's ultimately a spiritual battle. It's about good and evil. And there's plenty of evil to go around today. Yes. And I think especially today when you mention things like rhinos and people who really hold to certain views, but they run as something else. I think we need new terms. And I think at the root of this is anti-Christianity, which of course Marxism is, um, is determined to blot out. So Marxism has a history of destroying the family, destroying the economy, imposing income taxes, and then of course seizing the educational system. So you said you have a five-pronged attack on how to deal with this. Go into that, if you would. Okay, so so this is our, our blueprint to close the U.S. Department of Education and end all federal education mandates. And the reason we add the last part of ending all federal education mandates is because there are other federal uh, government agencies that affect um, local education as well. So the first step is to send all program management and funding to the states, including Pell Grants for college. So you send the programs and the money to the states and let them run those programs. Uh, Second step is to repeal all laws permitting federal intervention in K-12 education, starting with the Every Student Succeeds Act. So Every Student Succeeds Act was... um, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act that was started uh, with the war on poverty under LBJ, and then it became uh, No Child Left Behind, and then most recently, Every Student Succeeds Act. So we have to repeal all those federal laws that uh, interfere with local control of education. So then the third step is to privatize college loans programs through savings and loans in institutions. Um, Fourth is to eliminate all offices and divisions of the U.S. Department of Education and related spending. And then fifth and finally is to reduce federal tax collection, shifting education revenue responsibility entirely back to the states. So obviously, if you're going to close a multi-billion dollar federal agency, then the states and individuals should not have to be paying as high taxes as they are. So we need to shift that funding reduce the the federal tax collection. And, you know, if states need to step in and increase their taxes as as it being revenue neutral, then they can um, tax their state uh, and use that funding to implement the programs that they deem are important that the federal government had previously instituted. Right. And one of the things about a bureaucracy, bureaucracies don't get voted in. They're just sort of there permanently. And um, let's go into a little bit about the film. Um, Well, before I do that, let me say this. I love the fact that you have a big goal, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, and the more impossible it might seem, the more determined um, people who get it will be. 
But let me just comment, if 20 years ago, your children were in middle school, you don't have children in K through 12 right now, correct? No. Okay. No. So what happens, I think a lot of people are only interested when it's going to affect them. And right. I have tremendous respect for people who um, stay in the fight because they understand the implications and they recognize it as a war. Um, I've watched a lot of your videos and I've read a lot of what you had to say. And good golly, you are a warrior. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> you don't take incremental defeats enough to say, well, I guess this isn't what I should do. You hang in there and you continue to help. Um, like me, you have gray, white hair, right? So as the older women, we're supposed to help the younger women, the women right now who are responsible for their children. And you show this pretty well in the documentary, Truth and Lies in American Education. I love how you it starts because you are not the protagonist in this film. Your daughter-in-law is. And she starts on the journey of, I don't know how soon after she became your daughter-in-law, she became really aware of what you are all about. And rather than hammering for her, like, you must believe, you must believe, you just said, look, I'd like you to do some research and tell the story of what happened from the skeptical daughter-in-law to where she is now with U.S. Pie. Yeah, my uh, youngest son, Bobby, married April and... um I actually had hired my son to do some work for me because he was an English major and and he was helping me some, with some writing and things after they were first married. And he wasn't very satisfied with working for his mother. And so he suggested maybe April could do that work and he would go to work with his dad. And we have a family uh, construction business. So April um, started working for me and I gave her some required reading um, I needed her to understand the history and the background of education policy uh, until she was able to fully understand and grasp what we were dealing with. She, she wasn't going to be a lot of help to me. And she did exactly what I asked her to do. She read several books. Um, the Crimes of, Crimes of the Educators was the first book that she read. And I think you mentioned that you knew Sam Blumenfeld. Yes. And, and that was authored by him and Alex Newman. And Alex and I are great friends, and, and he's doing such wonderful things. I don't know if you know he's running for Congress, but uh, I learned that recently in Florida. So anyhow, she learned a lot. And she talks about it in the movie how, you know, at first she thought, oh, well, this has to be conspiracy theory. You know, there's no way all this stuff is true. But then the more she researched and she did her own research, she she went beyond reading the books that I required her to read. And she did research try to fact check uh, what was said in the books. And she learned that it was true. And so she has become a huge young advocate uh, for homeschool and for uh, helping correct the problems in our government schools. And she's really become the face of our organization, which is such a blessing because, as you pointed out, you know, most of us leading these kind of efforts are grandparents. And uh, to see a millennial really get the issues and be able to relay them effectively to other people is, is just such a blessing for our organization, our movement. And I'm very proud of April and, and all that she does. So let me just comment on that. As someone who homeschooled her own children for 28 plus years and has, I still consider myself a homeschooler in as much as I understand what's involved, why you need to do it. And I help other homeschooling families, but it's a lot better to let someone understand rather than just feed them conclusions. You could have just fed her conclusions. This is bad. This is bad. The government's bad. And maybe that would have lasted for a while but it wouldn't have convicted her that this is a real issue. And I think um, the method is appropriate in all areas that rather than trying to um, say you're wrong, I'm right, that you give people the opportunity to read it. She could have read those books and the one you mentioned by Blumenfeld and Newman, I, an amazing book. I, I knew Sam for years and years and years. This is probably his best work with Alex because he puts it all together and you get to see it. Um, if we're going to change minds, 
they have to understand what they have understood in a faulty manner. And I think that's what's important here. And I think COVID, who would have thought COVID would have helped your movement? Mm-hmm. Yeah, when kids were back home and parents started to see what was going on, all of a sudden, you became much more interesting to people, didn't you? Well, yes. And, and yeah, I often say that that was the silver lining, if you will, of the COVID pandemic was that parents did have the, that opportunity to see what their children were learning and they were not happy with what they saw. So it, it has caused outrage across the country. Parents, I'm sure you've seen, there's tons of YouTubes on Facebook of parents speaking out and their school board meetings. And of course, we know that then um, they were dubbed domestic terrorists for their outspoken behaviors. Some of the school districts in the state where I live, uh, they've been served no trespassing orders for just even showing up to speak out at meetings. Uh, It's so, so it is good. The COVID did help us. And, you know, it reminds me of um, the scripture that talks about how, uh, you know, the enemy meant it for harm, but God will use it for good. And so that's one of the good things that did come out of that. And, and then to your point about April and my not spoon feeding her and, and allowing her to uh, delve into the information and learn for herself, that is very important. And another thing that happened throughout that process, which you may find interesting, was she became saved. And so, you know, it was a, a gradual influence, I think, of working with me and and conversations that we had. It's interesting because when they first got married, I asked her if she was saved. And she said, yeah, about seven times. I knew she hadn't had, you know, the true Holy Spirit experience. Um, but over time, she did become saved and her whole life was transformed. And I think that's important, too, because in, under, in order to understand the truth, you have to know the truth. Right. And so I, you know, and that's where we get back to this idea of a um, a spiritual battle because it's good and evil and it's truth versus lies. And that's why, you know, we know the enemy um, is a liar. And and that's why we named our film Truth and Lies in American Education, because it is a, both of those aspects that we reveal in this documentary. Now, one of the things I like about the documentary, aside from the fact that I know some of the people that are in it, and this is a topic near and dear to my heart, you manage to take all that you know and keep it just about an hour. If there's anything true about a lot of the most important documentaries, once you go over the two-hour mark, unfortunately, American audiences are used to the half hour, the 60 minutes, or if they go to the movies, 90 minutes. So there's a lot I'm sure you wanted to say or could have said, but didn't say. So when you distilled it down to this and you brought in lots of people to give their point of view, what was your intent with the product in its final state? What were you hoping would happen? Well, you're absolutely right. It it was a lot of synthesizing to, to bring it down to the level. And that was our goal is to have it, you know, around an hour, because that's a, that's a perfect viewing for say um, a church group or a community group that wants to get people together and and watch it and then maybe do some Q and a afterward. Um, So it was extremely difficult to do that. We had tons and tons of footage with all the experts that we interviewed and our original goal, our, our leadership team actually did a timeline going all the way back to the Greeks and the Romans, uh, you know, with education policy and and looking at how we got to where we are today. And we went back that far because we understood that it's sort of the age old argument. And and this is really fundamentally where we are in this country today is whose responsibility is it to raise children, the state being the government or the family? So this has been a debate over time. And never before in the, this nation, nation's history have we been at such a, a tipping point on this topic. And, you know, we talk about this in the film. We talk about how their goal is to uh, put a wedge between a child and their parents. And that's exactly what's happening. 
And it's, it's really, um, it's shocking to see, like, for example, with um, some of the transgender cases we've looked at, and, and we interview Bernadette Broyles, who's an attorney that founded a nonprofit organization called Child and Parental Rights Campaign. And their sole mission is to defend families who government schools have transition transitioned into a gender opposite their biological gender. So it's so rampant in our country that she has formed an, an organization, and that is their sole mission. So what's happening is parents aren't being told and children are told not to tell their parents. And they're being given um, hormone um, and hormones and puberty blockers, and they're given uh, new pronouns and new uh, gender affirming, they call it names, and counseling these young children. Uh, one case that Bernadette is, is trying right now, they're siblings, uh, a boy and a girl, 11 and 12 years old. And the parents learned that this was happening. Thank God a courageous teacher uh, told the parents what was happening. She since got fired. Um, so the parents learned that this was happening and they told the school they absolutely had to stop. And the school said they had the right to do it based on uh, state laws, education laws. And so it's, it sounds so outrageous, but it is absolutely happening. And that's why in our film, we wanted to inform people, for people to understand this is how bad it's gotten. And it's happening with your tax dollars. You're paying for this. So that's why when you talked earlier about uh, people really won't get involved with something unless it affects them. Well, that's how education policy has always been all the 20 years I've been involved. It, people just kind of tune out if they don't have kids in school. But the problem is they are indoctrinating the masses. The majority of children go to government schools. They're being fully indoctrinated against our country, against Christianity. They're being sexualized. They're uh, being taught racist themes. Uh, they're being divided against and pitted against one another. And, and that's why this film is so important. But one other thing, I th and I mentioned earlier, is we really wanted to explain the workforce development model of education because everybody has bought that hook, line, and sinker. And it is a dangerous attempt by the federal government to control the economy, and they are pigeonholing students into particular career fields that will fulfill the needs of local industry. In some cases, they're even eliminating diplomas and replacing them with uh, certificates of mastery. So children in fifth or sixth grade are surveyed, and based on the results of that survey, um, they determine which job field will be best for them. And then they begin pigeonholing them in that career field. By high school, they have to declare a major, which, of course, we used to do in college. And, you know, my kids, when they went to college, they didn't even know. Like I said, my son was an English major, and now he, he works with the family construction business. So to think that a fifth or sixth grade student or even a high school student knows what they want to do with their future is just ridiculous. And then they're limited in what they can choose because the federal government is setting up regional um, workforce boards that are made up, they're comprised of um, educators and local industry. And, and these individuals decide what the jobs are going to be in their region of the country for the next 10 to 15 years. And, and that's, that's unpredictable. It's, it's not, it's, it, it doesn't even make, it's not common sense that they can do that. Right. You know what it reminds me of, Sherry? It reminds me of the five-year plans in communist China. In other mm. words, we're going to say what utopia should look like, right? And now right. we're going to prepare for it. So our teachers are, is the average public school teacher who belongs to the National Education Association, are teachers aware of these work programs? Oh, yeah, they're fully aware. They're implementing them. It's it's the it's the common st structure, um, and again, you know the 
the America has fallen for this scheme. And, you know, I learned about this uh, back when I first started in education policy. I used to attend educational policy conferences every year in St. Louis. They were led by Donna Hearn. I don't know if you knew Donna, but she worked under the Reagan administration in the Department of Ed. And she was tasked with going in and looking under the hood and finding out what they were doing. And this is what she uncovered. Um, This was probably 25 years ago, whenever Reagan, you know, right. Really dated myself here. And um, so we interviewed Donna in the film. She, she since deceased. They were so pleased that we were able to get her in the film. Um, but that's where I learned about this. And I would come home and talk about it. And I was the tinfoil hat lady, <laughs> you know, people. And even my father who taught me my conservative value said, you've really gone off the deep end this time, Sherry. So I've known about it for some time, um, and and many, you know, within our education policy circles have known about it, but this is a great opportunity in this film for us to really describe it, and again, we can't get into too much detail, but we do talk about it and expose it from Donna's perspective uh, and, and what, what we see the problems are with that. Okay, so let's walk somebody through it. So maybe you don't have children in school who are listening, but maybe you do. Um, hopefully, a lot of people have removed their children from the state schools and are homeschooling or have them in a good Christian school. But that doesn't alleviate our responsibility because all the people who go through the government schools are going to end up voting or they're going to be the people who we rely on for the various functions in our communities. So explain, like if um, some of the great minds or some of the great people in history, if Winston Churchill had been in the American school system, is it likely with low performing academics, which apparently he had, that he would not have been in a position to even assume anything that led up to being a prime minister? All right. Absolutely. He he would have been um, probably pigeonholed into some sort of tech technical school track, you know, where he could get some skills and be a welder or something along those lines. And, you know, I I think we've pushed um, post-secondary education too much uh, as well. And that's probably been an intentional agenda, too, because, you know, the liberals took over the schools. So, you know, if we don't get them in K-12, we'll certainly suck them into the machine, you know, in post-secondary. And so um, I think it's overrated. There's there's many brilliant people who don't have college degrees that have um, created great inventions and done wonderful things. So, you know, really it goes basically back to um, what we were talking about earlier, how, you know, our schools used to be effective and before they were infiltrated and, and taken over with a Marxist agenda and, the way that education was done, even before this country was founded, um, was in a classical form, a classical liberal arts form of education. And that's what worked in this country for many years. It worked in around the world for um, centuries. And that's what we need to get back to in this country is a classical form of education. That's what most homeschool families teach. And um, you also mentioned, you know, having kids, uh, hopefully kids are in in homeschools or a good Christian school. And you have to know that even the private schools have been affected. Um, I'm actually working with a Catholic private school, a group of parents in my state, and I'm I'm going in next week to do a presentation for them about critical race theory. And I'm going to help them strategize about how to try to shift this, their school, which they've always loved, uh, away from this Marxist agenda. So the uh, critical race theory, um, which is often called culturally responsive pedagogy or diversity, equity, and inclusion, it has infiltrated many of the private schools as well. So parents just need to be aware that just because you go to a private school doesn't mean you're going to shield your children from this, you need to be very thorough and understand what's being taught and ask the right questions before enrolling your child in a private or Christian school. And ultimately, the best solution is to homeschool because then you know exactly what your children are getting 
And it's really a wonderful experience. It's so, uh, and, and I didn't personally homeschool, but my daughter-in-law is, and she shares with me all the time um, about the value of it, how much she gets out of it as a mother and how close they are as a family. And it's just uh, such a blessing to see so many um, families now choosing to homeschool, even minority families. I think the the latest statistics I heard was that homeschooling had doubled and 41 percent of the new homeschool families were minority families. So and not only that, and Sam Blumenfeld said this for years because um, he was truly a crusader in this area that um, it has nothing to do with the educational level of the parents. It has nothing to do with the socioeconomic situation that they're in, nor the color of their skin. So when you teach people how to read properly and you don't confuse them with methods that are meant to confuse them and make it so that they don't want to read the classics, you see, the real crime here, and I think you'll probably agree, Sherry, is that once the schools and the educational establishment gets a hold of children, they become injured. So think about what it would be like. I mean, yes, people can go through life with one leg, you know, but that's not the ideal way to do it. Or you could go through life having lost a couple of fingers, but that's not the ideal way to do it. Well, they're turning out disabled students. And so after a while, the idea is it's too painful to read. It's too hard to read. I'm not interested anyway. I know how to work my smartphone, so that's all I really need. And so a lot of the people who are having children now had that kind of educational experience. So they need remedial help as much as their children do. Well, that's a very good point. Uh, Absolutely, because this didn't just start (laughs) during COVID. It has been um, over decades that this has been coming into the schools you know, when we do our presentations, we we show a timeline uh, going back to, you know, when the Department of Education was started and the different policies that were implemented thereafter. And so one of the big um, federal uh, interventions, there were three laws that were passed in the early 90s, and they were based on the the Dear Hillary letter written by Mark Tucker. Are you familiar with that, Andrea? You know, explain it because I, I, I don't think I could do a good explanation of it. Okay, so Mark Tucker um, wrote a letter to Hillary Clinton just as uh, Bill Clinton was elected president. And he laid out a plan, uh, this workforce development education plan, uh, an attempt by the federal government to control the economy. And in his letter, everything that he laid out was implemented through three federal laws in the early 90s. And uh, Bush Sr. was involved with this as well. And so they put all of these federal laws into place that set up this um, this workforce development model of education. So Mark Tucker's letter was uh, thought to be, at the time, uh, so critical that it was entered into the congressional record. And so it's it's had a huge effect on on education and, you know, taking us away from teaching children the foundations uh, into, again, this workforce development model of education, which just makes children cogs in a wheel for for the government. Right. And and so, yeah. I've always said, if you can read, you can teach someone else to read. If you can compute, you can teach someone else arithmetic, except sometimes that falls on the ears of people who were created dyslexics because of the method in which they were taught and feel stupid and have low self-esteem and will say things like, well, I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a rocket scientist. The truth is the mathematician or the rocket scientist is not an inherently better person. We don't know anything about their integrity. We don't know anything about their values. And so when it boils right down to it, this emphasis on removing children from government schools can have a tremendous effect on their parents who may have been miseducated and chances are they were. And then all of a sudden we won't have a federal government feeding us things that we have to say, well, I don't really know much about that. I mean, actually in some regards, Sherry, maybe domestic terrorist fits if the domestic policy is the destruction of the American family. 
right? I look at them as domestic terrorists. They look at me as domestic terrorists or anybody who does it. So we even have to learn to get beyond the language and the propaganda to be able to think. And if you're going to be able to think, it starts off with a um, solid foundation in reading that then can allow you to read all sorts of things. When, when you had April read the book you did, she could have come back and said, I'm not interested in helping you. And that was a chance you had to take, right? Right. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting, as you were talking about dyslexia, I'd forgotten that one of the women I met at the educational policy conferences one year was, she wrote a book about that, about the, um, I guess it was the whole language method of reading uh, causing dyslexia. And, um, I had a son, one of my three sons was diagnosed. Well, actually he wasn't diagnosed with dyslexia, but they assumed that's what he had. They said they couldn't diagnose it at the school. I was a bit naive at this time. Um, he was, I think he was in elementary school and, you know, they put him in a special uh, class with an IEP and all of that. And that could have really damaged his future. I didn't realize it at the time. Um, but my that's my son has really struggled in life. He's 33 years old now and he has, I believe, felt inferior, inferior to his siblings and other people. And it's caused him to choose a lifestyle that's not very healthy. So it's really sad, you know, when you think about. It's really child abuse, what's happening in government schools. It is literally <laughs> child abuse. And, and it's been generations of children that have suffered and continue to suffer. Right. But the good news, there is good news here. And again, we'll go back to our friend, the late Sam Blumenfeld. Sam was so convinced that this could be remedied, educational misteaching and um, this kind of uh, impediment if you went back and did it the way it should have been done in the first place. Um, how is it, and people say this all the time, how is it that when the Constitution when the proponents of the Constitution were trying to get it ratified, that they wrote the Federalist Papers and they were printed in newspapers. I dare anybody to read the Federalist Papers now and say it's easy reading to convince people to say yes to the Constitution. So there was much more literacy than there is now, and it's easily remedied. And that's why currently what I'm working on is trying to get churches who understand the kids have to get out of government schools, well, we've got to teach the kids correctly because by the time they're in sixth grade, they're so far behind the curve, but we can bring them up to speed. And it's really a ministry of the people of God to help people be able to read the word of God. Amen. Yeah. And you're right. There, there is hope. And that's, that's why I'm still in the fight. It's not, you know, that's why I haven't given up and we can never give up. We have to, we have to continue to fight and we have bigger opportunities now um, as we've talked about, um, to to write the ship on education. So I applaud you for what you're doing, working with local churches. I think churches absolutely need to step up and start schools and start educating children. Uh, I have a friend, um, Ray Moore. I don't know if you yes. know Ray, but he's also yeah. in our film. And he, he's been pushing this for Thirty years, uh, he formed an organization called Exodus Mandate, and he um, suggests that if enough Christians would withdraw from the government schools, uh, they would collapse. And so, um, that is an important mission that you have. And and I pray that more churches and pastors will get involved with the what we call the culture wars. You know, I see so many that that just stay unengaged and, you know, they talk about Jesus and love and all of that, but there, there's got to be a place for what's happening in the culture in, in the pulpit and in churches. And because it is a spiritual battle, as we have said. And so Christians need to be engaged. They need their armor on. They need to protect their children first and foremost. I don't know how many pastors I know uh, who are married to public school teachers. Yes. And I scratch my head on that all the time. I don't get it. And and that even one of the churches, I, we actually haven't been to church since COVID, which is I'm kind of ashamed to admit, uh, but we've been thinking about where we might visit. But one of the churches we were at most recently, 
Um, you know, they even they even said, you know, that m- my political calling in life, because I really feel this is a calling, um, was was not respected in the church. And so it's it was shocking, of course, to hear something like that. Um, but anyway, the good news is, too, there are um, classical education movements in our country, and that's another solution. And so, again, homeschooling families largely use the classical model. Uh, but there's also Hillsdale Colleges put out a uh, what they call the Barney Charter School. And it's a model that's being implemented um, in several states. And there's so much demand for it that they can't keep up with it. And um, so the, and then the other thing is with the re- research I've been doing with the Catholic families that I'm helping is that the Catholic schools um, – Around the country, a group of them have come together and said, we are going to teach the classical model. And they are they are walking away from uh, the Catholic bishop's direction of uh, what's essentially being taught in public schools. So why would a family pay high tuition to a private school uh, and only have them teach the same thing as the government schools? So, exactly. So so we are seeing an awakening in, in the country, and I think our film will really help with that. That is that is the goal with the film is to get people educated and motivated to join the movement and help us to grow a grassroots army because that's what it's going to take to stop this indoctrination of children. We need to protect children and we need to protect our country's freedom. And that's Absolutely. what we hope to do. So how can people um, find the film? They can go to the website. It is truthandliesfilm.us. I've, I've had to slow down when I say that because I did an interview recently and they thought it was truth in lies, but it's truthandliesus.film. So they can view the film there. Uh, there's a trailer there that they can share with other people. And, and you know, that's, that would be great if they would share it with friends and family and, and even get their church to watch it together. Exactly. Now I have to say this, and I'm probably my corny joke, probably you've heard it many times before, but uh, after watching the film and seeing you and seeing April, I came up with many are called, but the few are chosen. You've probably heard that before. (laughs) I have heard that. And you know, that's nearly a confirmation for me because I, I didn't get into the fact that I entered the race for superintendent of education again this year. I had to withdraw, but um, several people sent me that. And, and, and actually I heard it the first time when I ran before. So every time I hear it, I just know that God is cheering me on and telling me to uh, keep fighting and stay in the battle. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Sherry. I really do appreciate you taking the time. I know you're busy because Aside from this, you have a life and you have (laughs) family and you have a family business. So I hope people will watch the film. I highly recommend it. And um, I'm glad I found out about it. Thank you so much, Andrea. I've enjoyed talking to you and I hope we can stay connected. Absolutely. Listeners, as always, you can reach me at out of the question podcast at gmail.com. And I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to Out of the Question. For more information on this and other topics, please visit calcedon.edu.